careful and that is extremely important and this first hymn really sums that up knowing that our God is faithful and these are powerful words we all know this hymn so well but I want you to really concentrate on the words as we sing them this morning great is thy faithfulness O God my Father there is no shadow, sh shadow of turning with thee thou changest not thy compassions they fail not as thou hast been thou forever will be this is a powerful hymn so let us uh, raise our hearts and praise God this morning let us stand the same singing together. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, 
my Father. And Lord, we just thank you this morning for the faithfulness of Almighty God. Even in the midst of a very difficult time for our nation, and in particular a very trying time for our church family. We just thank you, Lord, that no matter what goes on or no matter what valley that we may be in, that thou remain faithful. And Lord, as we would meet here today, we would pray that you would really come to our gathering today, Lord, and that you would really speak to our hearts. And Lord, you know our uprisings and our down sittings. You know our difficulties. You know the challenges that each and every one of us face, both privately and publicly, Lord. You know each area of our lives. And we would pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, that you would meet us at the very point of our need. We realize, Lord, that the world is in complete free fall. And it's grasping onto nothing, only what chance or what lies ahead and whatever circumstances hold sway and rules their way. But Lord, this is not for the people of God and for the church of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that we can hold on to the one who is faithful and knowing that the Lord reigneth. In whatever circumstances that we might face, we have an anchor. We have a steadfast rock. That rock is Christ Jesus. And whatever we face, and we can well ask questions of why and what now and all of these things, but we thank you, Lord, that overshadowing everything is the sovereignty of Almighty God. We pray, Lord, for those who are affected with this uh, virus at this particular time. We pray for them each one. We pray for our pastors at this time and their wives. Lord, as they no doubt are praying, and uh, as we gather here this morning, we pray for your hand to truly be upon them. Lord, that they will know much of the presence of God as they seek guidance and as they study and as they pray. We pray, Lord, that you would go before them and your gracious hand will be upon them. We pray for the Brooks family today as well, that your hand will be upon them also, Lord, as they navigate through these difficult times. We think of Billy and Jennifer as well, Lord, and many others, Lord, that are affected, Lord, with this uh, virus, Lord. We just bring them to you, Father. And for those who are struggling, for those, Lord, who are anxious uh, in our church congregation, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name, that you would meet them at the very point, the very point of their need, we pray. And that they would know that underneath and all around are the everlasting arms of their Heavenly Father. We pray for our country. We pray for our nation. We pray for our government at this time. Lord, it can be easy and quite rightly sometimes to get uh, to ridicule and to talk down, Lord, of decisions that is made that grieve your word and grieve us. But Lord, above all, we pray that you would help us to pray for these people who rule our, our, and are in government over us, that we would bring them before the throne of heavenly grace. We pray, Lord, that you would save their precious souls, and Lord, that they would see that there is a deity, that there is a God in heaven. We thank you, Lord, that we're not coming today as a matter of fashion and as a matter of form, but we're worshipping the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. We're worshipping the one who hangs the earth on nothing. We're worshipping the one in whom we will worship. Those of us who belong to you, we worship you before the throne for all eternity. We pray, Lord, that this worship service today would be something of that. We pray, Lord, that you would lift our hearts. You would lift us our hearts in praise to give you thanks. We pray, Lord, for Walter and Ivy Graham at this time. Thank you, Lord, for bringing them in to the meetings. We pray, Lord, as they are unwell, particularly Walter, that your hand would be upon him today in hospital. Lord, that you would really come to him. And, Lord, that you would meet him at the very point of his need. And many others, Lord, as we have prayed, associated with this congregation, we bring them, each and every one of them, to you, Lord. So, Father, we pray that you would remain with us and you would help us, Lord, in whatever circumstances we face, to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray this in our Saviour's precious name. Amen. Well, we want to sing again uh, our next hymn. Will your anchor hold in the storms of life when the clouds unfold?
There are wings of strife. And this is a powerful hymn again, and one of our prayers uh, to God in these days that He is our anchor, no one else. Circumstances are not our anchor, religion is not our anchor, but God alone is our anchor. So let us stand and really sing out this hymn together. Will your anchor hold in the storms of life?
pleased to know that I'm free of COVID, uh, so everything is okay uh, with, with me anyway. Uh, but it's a, it's a difficult time, of course it is, uh, and Billy uh, is also in Jennifer, uh, and we, there are many others, uh, there are some uh, I know and some that I don't know have it, but there are many, many affected, and uh, we need to be praying for each other <coughs> at, at these times, and these are difficult times, uh, times of uncertainty, times of trial, uh, and as it opens the window for personal opinion and uh, personal views, uh, and that is, of course, uh, what we do, uh, but it's very important that we uh, are steadfast together and knowing uh, that God is on the throne uh, and that he will remember his own, and his promises are, sh are sure, and his promises are true. So ours this morning is not a, a, a doom and gloom, whilst we're to be careful, but ours is the upward, upward look today. So let us, as we meet together, uh, to praise the Lord this morning and to pray, uh, particularly for our pastors, and to pray for ourselves that the work of God uh, would continue faithfully as it has. Do remember tonight, uh, Sunday evening service, please come along uh, when no crowds are down for obvious reasons, but please make a special effort to come tonight uh, at 6.30. Um, and uh, well, it's a good thing or a bad thing I'm back with you tonight again uh, at 6.30 uh, the pre-service prayer meeting will be at 6 o'clock uh, so please avail of that and please please do come back tonight uh, uh, for our gospel, our gospel service uh, do also remember Wednesday our Bible study and prayer meeting will continue at 8pm 8 8 and Reverend Malcolm Patterson uh, will be speaking at our Wednesday uh, prayer meeting and Bible study. Uh, so please remember that as well. Lifeliners on Friday at 7 p.m. Uh, will continue. Uh, remember that Sunday, uh, 10.40 Sunday School uh, in the will of the Lord and Bible class at 10.40. And then we have our uh, 11.30 morning worship service uh, with John Weir uh, will be with us uh, for both morning and evening. And uh, please also remember that Children's Church uh, will be on both at the, this evening service and next Sunday evening. Uh, so do remember, next Sunday, uh, in the will of the Lord, uh, these meetings. We do hope uh, that Pastor Samuel and Pastor Maxwell will be back with us uh, next Sunday uh, as they uh, come out of their uh, isolation period. Uh, uh, the, the board of the church ha has also taken a very difficult decision uh, that the forthcoming mission uh, will be postponed. Um, it won't be cancelled, uh, but it will be uh, postponed. Uh, now, I know that will bring much disappointment to many of you uh, because we have been praying much uh, for the mission, uh, but uh, we believe that this is a very sensible decision. Uh, not least for the reason of the internal uh, situation that we find ourselves. Uh, I think it's very important to stress that. Uh, of course, COVID isn't going to go away, uh, and if COVID had uh, been right in, uh, outside, of course, we would make every effort uh, to be safe and to, to run the mission. But because of our internal situation, uh, we believe that it's very sensible uh, that we postpone the mission. Uh, and uh, that is, comes with certainly very heavy hearts, but we know and we trust that you understand uh, the situation. But please continue to pray uh, uh, as we navigate in these next times uh, as well, even and certainly for our evangelistic outreaches as well, uh, that the Lord will guide uh, and that the Lord will bless us in the, in the days that, that lie ahead. We do also want to congratulate uh, Andrew and Emma Crane on the birth of their little daughter, Abby Faith, and we trust that they know the Lord's blessing, uh, such a blessing for a little baby, uh, and we really want to congratulate them uh, on the birth of little Abby Faith. So just now, uh, we'll uh, sing again, uh, and the children can leave uh, during our next uh, hymn, please. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of the Spirit, washed in his blood. And I wonder, 
uh, for those of you who are in here, and we welcome also those who are listening in the cars as well. Uh, and I wonder, can you say it in these times that it is a blessed assurance that Jesus is yours? So let us sing this as we prepare our hearts, as we open God's word. Uh, let us prepare as we sing this hymn, and if you ask the Lord to speak to you this morning. Uh, so let us sing this, rising to sing. He cannot be my disciple. 
And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost whether we have sufficient to finish it? Lest happily, after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost its savour, whether with shall it be seasoned, it is neither fit for the land, nor yet for the dunghead. But men cast it out. And I want you to notice how Jesus finishes this, these, these verses. Basically he's saying if there's any of you that can listen at all, you need to listen to this. He says, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. At all costs, hear what I am saying. Let us turn as we, in a word of prayer, as we turn to this passage together. Our gracious God and eternal Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness and graciousness in each and every one of our lives. And we pray, Lord, as we turn to this chapter, Lord, that you would go before us and, Lord, that you would meet us wherever there's a need, Lord, where there's a challenge, where there's an encouragement. We pray, Lord, that you would help us today and that your name would be glorified and that your name would be uplifted. We pray this in our Saviour's precious and every word you name. Amen. The Bible speaks very clearly of two rules. We read in Matthew's Gospel 7, 13 and 14. We read these words. Enter ye in at the straight gate. Now straight means small. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. The Bible speaks of two roads. On the broad road, we have the majority. Now there are many lanes to the broad road. There's the clean side and there's the filthy side. But there's the broad road. It speaks of a narrow road. And sadly, the minority is on that road. Now we are on one or the other. It's as simple as that. We are either saved this morning on the narrow road heading for heaven and for home. And if you're not saved today, and for those that are listening to me, if you're unsaved, you are on the broad road that leads to damnation and leads to destruction. But this narrow road that we're speaking of is a difficult path. It's not easy. Any narrow road is difficult. And this passage that we read of speaks in a very, very remarkable and very, very deep, straight, cutting language. We have read that verse, and I'm sure the one that stands out to you is verse 26. It's very straight cutting. Therefore, it needs our careful interpretation 
and very exact understanding what this verse and these verses are telling us. Now whilst we live in a difficult situation and difficult times, and of course the Church of Jesus Christ has always lived in difficult and tumultuous times. Of course it has. But what we face and what lies ahead is going to be difficult. And we want to be real this morning. It's going to be difficult. What lies before for the church of Jesus Christ and for those who bear his name, it's going to be a difficult, a narrow and a windy road. It's going to be difficult. And I was thinking, what could I share this morning to these people that could bring a sense of encouragement and a sense of comfort at these times? And even as we navigate for the times that lie ahead, and my, my heart and my mind was drawn to this chapter, because here is where it begins. Now let me explain. For those that are going to face the trying circumstances and the difficulties that lie ahead for the church of Jesus Christ. And to be, in the proper sense of the word, a disciple of Jesus Christ. Let me say to you, and as, the, as is the biblical standard, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ will cost you everything. To be a disciple of Jesus Christ will cost you everything. When Jesus left the, Pharisee, the Pharisee's house, as what is in the preceding verses to what we have broken into, verse 25, we break into a new paragraph in this chapter. And Jesus here, and I want to set the scene, great crowds were following him. And great crowds were with him. And as the fame, if you like, of, 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 of Christ at that time began to become abroad, he began to get many, many followers. People were interested in what he was saying. And we know what happens, a crowd brings a crowd. But Jesus here was not impressed with the crowd's enthusiasm. He was not impressed with the, the numbers that were around him. The vast majority were not interested in the teachings of Jesus Christ. The vast majority of the crowds that were here, and verse 25 tells us that, of the great multitudes, thousands and thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of people, and they were not interested primarily in the spiritual teachings of Christ. Some wanted miracles, and Jesus was performing miracles at that time. Others wanted to be fed because they no doubt were hungry. Others hoped that this Messiah, as they would have hoped that he would have been, would have been the one that would have totally established David's promised kingdom and would have dethroned the Roman Empire. So that's why the crowds were gathered. That's why the great multitude, of, as verse 25 tells us, and there went great multitudes with him. And he turned and said unto them. What did he say to them? As these crowds, and you know what crowds Nosy people in crowds. Everyone seeking to, to, to get what they could get from Jesus. But Jesus preached a sermon there that would be direct, it would be pointed, and it would thin the ranks. It would inevitably thin the ranks of the multitudes of people. You see, the truth of the gospel, the truth of and the true words of Christ and the very sense in which he was in on this earth. The truth of the gospel always divides. And Jesus was calling, not for spectators, but he was calling for recruits. That's, 
That's what Jesus was saying. And it's very profound. As Jesus had these hundreds of thousands of people around him. He wasn't impressed with the crowds. He got straight to the point. And when it comes to discipleship. Jesus wants quality rather than quantity. Discipleship. It's a powerful word. Jesus wants his house filled. Even though the ranks were going to be diminished here. Verse 23 actually of the same, of the same chapter tells us. That Jesus wanted his house to be filled. And we know that it's the passion. And it's, we know it's the very longing of the heart of God. That not any should perish. But that all should come to repentance. Jesus wants many and all to be, all to be saved. But here in his message. And we need to learn what he is telling us here. Because he's setting the standard very, very high. To be a Christian, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, in these days and in the days that are to come, to be a disciple will cost you everything. A disciple is a learner. One who, this is the definition, one who attaches himself or herself to a teacher in order to learn a tree or a subject. I suppose perhaps the nearest equivalent that we could get as we try and navigate this is that the nearest equivalent is an apprentice, one who learns by watching and doing. You know what an apprentice is, and I have been there myself. To be an apprentice, you, you watch the tradesman and you watch everything that he's doing and you do what he does and you, and you don't do what he doesn't do. And you are with him every step of the way. You're attached to him. You're sold out to what he's telling you. The word disciple was, is, was the most common name of the followers of Christ. The word disciple. It is used 264 times in the Gospels and Acts. To be a disciple of Jesus Christ will cost us everything. Now it didn't cost us anything to purchase redemption. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying to be a disciple of Jesus Christ will cost us on this earth. It will cost us everything. And as we face the trials and as we face the persecutions that no doubt are coming, it's only those who truly belong to Jesus Christ. It's only those who are true disciples. Now that's not for us to give a doom and gloom message that, 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 there's, there's, that there's hard times ahead. The world would say it's a doom and gloom message. But dear people this morning, for the child of God, for those who are disciples of Jesus Christ, whatever comes our way in terms of persecution and standing for what the Bible says, that is not a doom and gloom message. But it's one that we face with anticipation. If we're, if a soldier is in war and heading to war, he's not, he's not in doom and gloom of what lies ahead. He's there with his armor on and he charges towards the end. That's what is a disciple of Jesus Christ is. Does it mean that we can be afraid? Of, of course, it, we can face the trials and the circumstances. But when we lean on him, it's the, it's the quiet voice within us, the quiet leaning and groanings of the Spirit of God within our spirits, that we belong to him, and that he is with us every step of the way. Dear people this morning, 
To be a disciple of Jesus Christ is something other than saying a sinner's prayer. It's something other than just bearing the name of being a Christian. For those who are not a true disciple of Jesus Christ, when it comes to the trials and when it comes to the, the fierce enemy that we face on this narrow road, you'll not stand. You'll fall by the wayside. This is the message that Jesus was speaking himself. And I want you to read verse 26, and with this we unfold this verse. Jesus here said to these multitudes of people, he said, If any man come to me, and hate not his father, and mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Did Jesus really, did he really say this? It almost seems at face value contradictive, doesn't it? How can we hate our father and our mother? How can we hate our mother and our wives and our children and our brethren and our sisters? Well, let me explain. And for this needs our attention and a, prof, a, 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 and a proper explanation of this verse. In the fifth commandment, we are told to honour our father and our mother. Moses instructed us to love our neighbour, Leviticus 19.18. Jesus told us to love our enemies, Matthew 22.39. Jesus' mother was on the cross and he had compassion upon her. We are to look after our mothers, John 19.27. Paul says that husbands, we are to love our wives as Christ loved the church, Ephesians 5, 25. We are to provide for our household, because if we don't, we're an infidel, 1 Timothy 5 and 8. So the Bible is clear that we're to honour our father and mother, we're to love our wives, and we're to love our brethren, we're to love our brothers and sisters. So is this a contradictive statement here? Of course it's not. Jesus here, and this is extremely important as we study scripture that we know what is going on here. Jesus is speaking in terms, and I don't want to give you an English lesson this morning, but Jesus is speaking in an hyperbole. And what an hyperbole means is that he is exaggerating the point. He is not literally saying that we are to hate our mother and our father and our brethren and our wives and, and all of that. He is not saying that. What he is saying is he is exaggerating the point. He is provoking our thinking. If you want to get the point in something, you give the two contrasts at each ends of the spectrum. So Jesus here was speaking in an hyperbole. So you've learned something today. He is exaggerating the point for people to listen to what he's saying. Jesus is also saying here that our love for Christ, now listen to this, that our love for Christ should make all other loves Look like him in comparison. Do you get what I'm saying? He is saying, and is there any more love than we have for our father and our mother and our wives in particular, and, and even our brethren? So, you know that the love that we have towards this people, but our love to those of our nearest and dearest should look like his in comparison to our love for Jesus Christ. I'm sure that these multitudes of people, I'll tell you this, this would have thinned their eyes. He said, he said very clearly, at the end of that verse, if any man come to me and hate 
not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters yet? And he laid the, the axe to the root of the tree. He says, and his own life also. He cannot be my disciple. Dear people this morning, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, a true disciple of Jesus Christ will cost you everything. He said, yes, even his own life. Is there anything greater to our barrier in loving Jesus Christ than self? The greatest barrier to true discipleship and following Christ is me, is sin. We would rather have our own pleasures, our own ambitions, our own obsessions, our own things that self-absorb us. Our greatest enemy is sin. Isn't it? Jesus says here in this verse, dear people, this morning, and he is saying, for those who we love the most, and for those who love themselves <coughs> and self-serve, he says if we don't hit those things in terms of what I have explained, if we don't love those things less, than Jesus Christ, he cannot be my disciple. These, these are very, very pointed verses. And this is Jesus speaking. Look at verse 27. Let us read it together. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. The carrying a cross, it's difficult for us to understand what that really means. For someone to carry a cross, it was the capital punishment of that time. To is Jesus really asking us to, to bear a symbol and a, a, an instrument of capital punishment? To bear a cross, what does it mean? It means our daily identification with Christ in shame, in suffering, and surrendering to the will of Almighty God. It means death to self. It means death to our plans. It means death to our ambitions. It means death to ourselves. In presented in these terms, it's not a bit of wonder that the crowd fluttered away. Dear people this morning, to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ is no soft thing. It's no silly and no light-hearted thing. <coughs> Jesus here is telling us to come after me, he says in this verse. Come, that's present tense, that's every moment of every day. That's coming after Christ himself. And what better one to follow. And you know this? This is not super Christianity. This is not a way out there. This is not for those who are preachers or elders or hold office in the church. Dear people this morning, this is the first step 
to being a Christian. This, this is the basic level. We have, it has been bred in Christianity in the West that when we say the sinner's prayer and we in some way identify as to being a Christian that, that we are on the way to heaven. Dear people this morning, we are to count the cost. Because this is not a doom and gloom message. This is not a message to, to make you anxious or to make you question your salvation. But we need to be sure. You need to be sure that you are a true disciple of Jesus Christ. This, this is the words of, of Christ himself. He said that you cannot be my disciple. You, you will not be my disciple. If you don't take up your cross, take up the shame of the cross, take up the shame of Christ, take up the embarrassment of Jesus Christ, take up to, to, to deny our self motives, to deny our ambitions, to deny everything and to follow him. And whatever the cost may be, whatever lies ahead, whatever persecution lies ahead, I am going to follow him. And does that mean that each person is called into ministry and, and called in? That's not what this is saying. This is saying for the basic, the basic entry level. This is the basic level of Christianity. This is the true level of Christianity. This is what it means to be born again. This is what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. That he is our everything. Because if he is not our everything. We need to call into question. Am I a true disciple of Jesus Christ? And we can fluff it up. And we can fluff it up any other way. These verses that Jesus himself was speaking. I need to be true to these verses today. And we need encouragement. And I'll tell you this, if you're thinking of this in the proper way, this will bring you all the encouragement you need. Because I'm not asking you, and I'm not imploring to you in God's word that we follow something other. We're imploring to you to follow Jesus Christ. The one who loves you. The one who died on the cross for you. The one who rose for you. And the one who knows the very hairs on your head. And the one who wants to bring you to heaven. Should that not encourage us as a church family this morning? Knowing that we follow him. Where the conflict lies and where the anger comes in is when we don't want to follow. And that he doesn't cover everything. That's where the contention happens. That's where the conflict arises. That's where the, the spirit comes up within us that this is a high bar here. I, we have made this to be a way out there, Christianity. No cost, no surrender, and no submission to Jesus Christ. That's what these verses are telling us. Very, very clearly. And very, very concisely. Now in verses 28 to 32, let us read them very quickly. Jesus, as he broke into this verse, as what has become verse 28, Jesus here was saying to these people, now he has hit them with about his love towards him. He has also hit them about bearing a cross. And that would have been very clear to those people. They knew what a cross meant. But he is saying in these verses. For those who are a true disciple of Jesus Christ. Needs to count the cost. And he gives very very clear parables or examples of that. Let us read them. For which of you intending to build a tower. Sitteth not down first and counteth the cost whether we have su sufficient to finish it. So would any of you build a house and not sit down and, and do the maths and do the arithmetic and, and count the cost of what the house is going to be? 
He, he said in the next verse, lest happily after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold is be, begin to mock him. I know there's some people that put the foundations in the house and and it's maybe no work has happened for a while. And what do people say? That don't know the truth the, the, the true story to say, well, there must be enough money to finish that house. Jesus here is saying that before you commit to being a disciple. You need to count the cost. You need to weigh it up here. He said in verse 30, saying, this, sorry, verse 31, or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Or else while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth, sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. He's, what, what king, what nation would Great Britain go to war and not count the cost? Not, would they not sit in a command room and, and count and weigh up the, 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 the pros and cons? They would count the cost. And to be a disciple, for, for those who are thinking of surrendering their lives to Jesus Christ, Whilst we bring the invitation in all the love and we, we invoke people to come to the cross of Jesus Christ, what we do say and what we should say, you need to count the cost. Because if you don't count the cost and it's not clear to you, then you run the risk of not being saved at all. Then you run the risk of not being a true disciple of Jesus Christ. We are to count the cost. And of course the cost, as I have explained earlier, the cost for those who want to yield their lives to Jesus Christ, for those who are coming to the foot of the old rugged cross, they don't, for those who are genuine, they don't care what the cost is. True repentance is that I don't, I deserve to go to a lost eternity. I deserve to go to hell. I, I, de I deserve all of that because I see the wonder and mighty work of the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. For those who are truly want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, the cost means nothing. As we face the future, as we face the difficulties that we will face, we need to be true disciples of Jesus Christ. He is and should be our everything. Our everything. Second place will not do. It, it cannot do. How can I be a true follower of Jesus Christ and not have my all surrendered to him? Because that is the qualification team. This is what Jesus is saying. Explicitly and clear. And if you don't want to come down this road and you, and you count the cost and you don't think you'll be able to survive, don't, take, don't be a disciple. That's what he's saying here. We are told as Christians, we're the Great Commission, we are told to go into all the world to preach the gospel and we're to go and to make what? Disciples. What has infiltrated the church in, in, in particularly America and, and, and in the West? Anything for numbers, anything to have people to be to make some kind of profession, raise their hand or to say some prayer, and no sacrifice. No surrender. No taking up the cross. And dear people this morning, I bring this message to you with all the love in my heart. We need to be faithful to this book. We need to be faithful to this text. This is what Jesus is saying. Anyone that has done anything for Jesus Christ has been a true disciple. 
anyone. That anyone that has done anything for Jesus Christ hasn't been someone that has just that has just made some kind of commitment. What about the twelve apostles or the eleven? Each and every one of them were martyred, apart from John. Saying that we're all going to be martyred. Please don't say I'm saying that. But the 12 apostles who followed Jesus Christ, each of them apart from John, were martyred and killed for their stand. Paul, Peter and Paul were beheaded. Peter was crucified. Andrew was crucified. Thomas was pierced through with spears with four soldiers. Philip was cruelly put to, put to death. Matthew was stabbed in Ethiopia. Bartholomew was martyred. James was stoned and clubbed to death. Matthias was death by burning. The man who, who brought our Bible into the same language was martyred. Our reformers to take the church out of papal Rome that we could have civil and religious liberty, we're all martyred. So what is the cost? What is this cost? This is the cost of true discipleship. This is the cost of genuine Christianity. This is the cost of being a true follower of Jesus Christ. Dear people this morning, if he is not your everything, now I know times we can follow afar off and all of that. I know that. Dear people this morning, you are to count the cost. You are to examine yourselves, to examine ourselves. Am I a true disciple of Jesus Christ? He is he, my everything. If I'm living my life contrary to the word of God, then questions are asked. It, the question must be asked. There must be fruit. There, there must be these things. We, we are to be true disciples of Jesus Christ. Because dear people, eternity back on us. For, for the innumerable saints that have gone on before, all that we will do in heaven is to worship the Lamb. We will kneel before the throne. You can read about it in Revelation. We will kneel before the throne and we worship Him forever. Forever and forever and forever. But if that is not my heart down here, how can it be up there? True discipleship. It's the only thing that works. It's the only thing that takes that will last the test of time. It's the only thing that will get you through the difficulties, through the trials, through death itself. True discipleship. Now he spoke at the and our time's gone. He spoke at the end of this chapter of uh, in, in verse. Uh, verse 34. He says, salt is good, but if salt has lost its savour, wherewith it shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land or for the dunghead, but men cast it out. He's speaking for those who identify as being a disciple and are not. And he ends with this. He that hath an ear, let him hear. If any of you can hear at all, you need to listen to what I'm saying. You need to listen. The demand is everything. He has purchased our souls with his precious blood. He has redeemed us. He has called us by our name. We are his. And the demand, dear people this morning, is absolutely everything. Not part, 
but absolutely everything to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And that fills. Knowing that we can follow Christ. And that's where the, that's where the contentment is. That, that's where the, the satisfaction lies. Because in Matthew's Gospel, it speaks of uh, an oxen being on a yoke. Where two oxen were together on a yoke. And the Bible says that when we are in line with Christ, the burden is light. It's easy because we are with him on that yoke just as two oxen are together and we go where he goes and there's no stress. Of course there's a stress on the narrow road. But as we face the narrow road, we're with Christ, the one who has redeemed you and the one who loves you and the one who wants to put his arms around you as we face the narrow road. Road. This road, I'll tell you this, this road is narrow. And that's why it's in the minority. I trust this morning that this will be your heart's desire. That you are a true follower of Jesus Christ. That's where true contentment is. I finish with this, a poem. The die has been cast. This is speaking of a disciple. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I will not look up, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, Position, promotion, popularity. I do not have to be right first, tops, recognized, praised, regarded or rewarded. I now live by faith, love by patience, live by prayer, labor by power. My pace is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions are few, my guide reliable and my mission clear. True discipleship will cost you everything. And I trust as we navigate in these uncertain times, we're not to be fearful, we're not to be downcast, we're not to be doom and gloom, but we are to be in that yoke with our Heavenly Father. And we are to be a disciple and we follow him no matter what the cost. Should that mean death itself? Let's close with a word of prayer. Our gracious and eternal Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your presence with us today. And Lord, these are very direct words from the very mouth of our Saviour, from your mouth, Father. And Lord, we pray that we will count the cost, that we will be those who are true disciples of Jesus Christ, those that are aiming for the glory and the glory of God alone, those that are heading for heaven and home, those, Lord, that our lives will be sold out for Jesus Christ. Lord, we realize that this is the basic, the basic level. This is genuine discipleship. Father, we praise you for the provision that has been made. We can't do anything by works or anything, Father. It's all by the work of Jesus Christ alone. But Father, we realize that you help us. We pray, Lord, for those who listen to this message, that this will be a challenge, but yeah, above all, an encouragement to know that Christ is with us every step of the way. We pray, Lord, that your hand will truly be upon us. Keep your hand upon us, Lord, as a church family in these days. In our Savior's precious and ever worthy name. Amen. Thank you very much for listening today. Please, please come back today if you can at all. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a encouragement to see you all here. Uh, and thank you very much.